So thanks, Stu, for that really generous introduction. What I wanted to do today is talk through issues of values and trust in science, and in particular, public trust in science. That's the main question, not the trust relationships internal to science or among scientists. Um, now, apparently, I have to use the clicker this to move things forward. What, what are, where are we with public trust in science? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you ask the welcome trust, um, they'll say we're doing better um, because of the COVID crisis. Uh, globally, their uh, trust in science has improved, including, you know, this is the bar graph for, you know, trusting scientists a lot. Um, so, you know, 43% of the world trusts a lot the scientists in their own country. Um, and probably even more trust the scientists some. So, you know, it looks like more than half, which is uh, pretty good. Historically, that's been about average, just so, you know, like this isn't like a big change. But if you ask the Pew Center, um, they, uh, in the US, they think that uh, they found that scientists, um, trust in science has declined, uh, particularly among Republicans. So who you ask and how you ask them, it matters a big deal particularly when you think about the number of ways that uh, people ask the public whether they trust science. Sometimes it's measured in terms of, do you agree with scientists when they say that anthropogenic uh, climate change is a real thing or that vaccines are safe and effective? Sometimes it's, do you believe that scientists act in the public good, which is different than agreement. Um, sometimes it's belief that scientists are telling you the truth as at least they see it. Um, and sometimes it's whether or not you would rely on the scientific information. Note that all of these things are actually different. Like you could imagine a situation where um, you believe that scientists will act in the public good and you believe that scientists are telling the truth, but you're not actually gonna rely on the information because you think they're wrong. Right, um, so that's totally plausible. And a lot of the sort of public trust surveys um, will use whichever one of these in the long term, like Pew tends to use um, the belief that scientists will act in the public good as a measure of trust, but it's not necessarily the, the one that is most central. A lot of times when scientists worry about public trust in science, it's not um, the middle two, it's, Either the public is agreeing with them. That's the thing they really want. They want the public to agree with them or they want the public to use the science. They want the, the public to trust the information that the scientists are giving them and to use it for decision making. Over the last uh, 50 or so years, when you look at historical data, um, it's really unclear whether public trust in science is declining, increasing or unstable. There does seem to be a worsening trust in science for at least some of these measures among Republicans for at least some issues. Um, but sometimes when you step back and look at it, it all looks kind of stable, which is odd, um, given the sense of continual crisis we have around it. What I want to focus in this talk is less about whether or not the public, in fact, does trust science, but whether or not science is trustworthy and on what basis it should, it should be viewed as trustworthy. And in particular, this is the, the challenge for thinking about this is for the non expert for people who don't have scientific expertise, how are they supposed to assess whether or not science is trustworthy. It can't be by becoming a scientist themselves like that that's right out <laughs> so without scientific expertise, how are they supposed to do this. If you happen to listen to Matt Brown's talk from this past February. He gives this really depressing overview of lots of reasons the public might actually distrust science currently. Wow, uh, he kept going like, you know, he lays out the first two or three and then he kept having more in the talk and he ended up with six. Um, that science is unaccountable to the public generally, that it's the people who do science are unrepresentative of the general public, that it tends to deflect its responsibility for harmful outcomes of its work, that racism and sexism has historically been endemic, that there's an increasing commercialization and conflict of interest as a result of that, that there are bad incentives in science, which lead to bad results, questionable research practices, outright fraud, and there's a lot of overreach and overconfidence in scientific claims. Whew, not a pretty picture. Um, 
in his talk, uh, which I highly recommend, he does try to look at institutional solutions to try to address these things. Um, but against that backdrop, suppose you're a member of the public and you know all that. How, how would you trust science? What would the basis be for trusting science in the face of all those reasons for distrust? And I'm going to argue in this uh, brief talk that there are three things that uh, are good bases for the um, public trust in science and that we need all three of them. One is evidence of functioning expertise that can be had without actually having that expertise. Um, a second is a critical and diverse, properly functioning scientific community. And the third is shared values. And we cannot do, I think, without that third one. Okay, so how is a non-expert supposed to actually detect functioning expertise? Well, I think there's sort of a spectrum, um, but on one end of the spectrum is uh, expertise where success is easy to detect. Um, this tends to be the focus of a lot of literature on expertise, things like chess masters, go masters, chefs, mechanics, um, back from Aristotle. You know, if the chess master wins the game against other chess masters, they're an expert chess player. If the chef makes a meal that you enjoy, they're an expert chef. If the mechanic fixes your car, they're an expert mechanic. Um, so there are these cases where expertise, we don't have to, we don't need deeper explanations. We don't need to know why the chess master did what they did to win the game. They did it and it worked and we can tell. Then there's the expertise that's actually the issues of controversy. No one actually really sort of worries about whether or not they should trust a chess master to win chess games. They already do it, they're experts. The controversies of our expertise in society tend to be about expertise that's not easy to detect success for. Um, so you can't really aren't quite sure whether climate modelers are getting it right. And if we wait long enough till we know that they're right, we're done for, right? So the time frames are just too long for that kind of thing. Or you have epidemiologists who are telling you that there's a certain disease or a certain cause of disease that you might worry about, but there are lots of confounders. And again, the time frames for really sorting that out are going to be too long for sensible action. It's those kinds of expertise, uh, experts that we desperately need to have informing our decisions, but easy success is not going to be a, a way to measure or way to assess that expert for the non-expert. So um, in these sorts of cases, I think the thing that experts have to do is they have to explain their judgments. They have to use a narrative form. They have to describe roughly, not the level of um, actual expert discourse, but roughly why they think what they think in the face of the complicated evidence that's in front of them. And um, this, I think, is really important, so not so that you make the public expert themselves, but so they see the complicated nature of the judgment, the terrain that the experts actually working in. Um, and that actually is just kind of the beginning of uh, evidence that someone is an expert, that if they don't have success measures that are readily accessible, you need to ask them, well, why do you think what you think? And they need to give you answers that seem sufficiently rich and plausible, even if you as the non-expert can't follow all the details. You also need that expert to be actually part of a critical and well-functioning diverse expert, or in this case, scientific community. So um, even chess masters have to play other chess masters in order for you to know that they're a chess master. So they have to also be part of a critical expert community. But for a scientific community, that means locations for debate, criticism, and discussion that are openly available, that are um, widely participated in, that have the right kind of uptake of criticism and response. Think of conferences with Q&A sessions, journals with responses and letters, online fora that don't um, devolve into trolling, um, and you know, following kinds of peer review norms that enable people to feel like, oh, okay, there is a critical um, mass of people discussing an issue. And that has to be sort of um, backed up by a culture that takes seriously the critical debate that really hones and refines expertise. So this includes an expectation of both raising and responding to criticism, which is why we have a Q&A session at the end of my talk today. <laughs> um, so this is all very reflexive. 
Um, and then this also has to be open to doors for all who want to join the community and participate in actual criticism and debate, not uh, inquiry facades, um, which is just kind of another form of trolling, but actually um, being part of the discussion and be taking on board criticism themselves. <clears throat> so, you know, this is something that Naomi Oreskes, uh emphasizes in her book, Why Trust Science, that Helen Longineau pioneered in her 1990 book, Science and Social Knowledge. This is a really key component of um, why we should trust science. And even when scientists might be wrong, it's because they're part of, you know, ultimately we'll find out 20 years from now they're wrong, um, but that they're part of such an expert community that is doing the best they can epistemically is why uh, we should trust what they say and use it to make decisions. The third basis, though, whoops, why did it do that? The third basis is um, that shared values, uh, shared values are needed for uh, trust. Um, and that's because uh, shared values are used in judgments in science and thus knowing that someone actually um, made judgments like you would um, is key to have, making sure that the knowledge that's being formed is formed is being informed by the concerns that you have as a member of the public. So our problems frame to include what a member of the public cares about. Are the methods sufficiently capable of capturing what the member of the public cares about? Is the evidence strong enough given my concern over the over risks of error? These are all moments where values are really important in science. Um, and we need experts to um, make their values available to us at these key moments so that we can actually find the experts that we should trust. Um, this doesn't mean that shared values are an overriding thing. The expert still has to be part of an actual expert community actually discussing things. They have to actually have expertise. Just having shared values is insufficient. Um, but without the shared values, uh, you need you would end up having uh, experts that aren't framing problems to capture what you concern what you're concerned with, or aren't weighing the risks of error in the way that you would. And as members of the general public, we should trust the experts who make judgments as we would if we had their expertise. That's where the shared values really come into play. So this is for those of this is this is sort of remedial in case um, <laughs> you aren't familiar with this, but you probably all know this. So you know, science should not be value free. Um, there are these two crucial places for social ethical values in science: the directing of efforts and framing of problems, including the right range of hypotheses and evidence, and also values deciding what counts as sufficient evidence, how much uncertainty we're willing to accept, which errors are most important to avoid: false positives or false negatives because those two things are so central, we can't have value-free science and we shouldn't want to have value-free science. And then values are also needed for methods and modeling decisions and use decisions. But just those two things alone make values crucial for the functioning of science, for the doing of science, and thus also as a basis of trust in science. This doesn't mean that values can do anything though in science. Values should not supplant evidence, so you shouldn't ignore evidence that conflicts with values. It should make you worry about things, but you don't just set it aside because it's um, unwelcome. It shouldn't be reasons to subvert research, like picking a method that will guarantee a particular result that's clearly unacceptable practice because that undermines the value of inquiry itself or be reasons to ignore criticisms. So I think these kinds of limits on science, on values in science keep values from biasing science um, and also protect thus the objectivity of science, which doesn't depend on being value free, as I argued way, way a long time ago, like 15 years ago. So now what should we think about consensus? Consensus has been held up as a paragon of trustworthy science, right, um, for the last 20 years. And my view just kind of like doesn't make a lot of consensus. So why is that? Well, we think there are two different cases. Let's talk about the consensus case first. So as everyone who uses consensus as a marker for trust acknowledges, 
it's not just any consensus that the public should trust. It has to be a trustworthy consensus. <laughs> and so what makes a, a trustworthy consensus it has to be properly formed by ongoing good debates. It can't be sort of artificially constructed. It has to be among experts who are themselves trustworthy. So they can't all be bought by the tobacco industry. Um, they have to be trustworthy experts and a sufficiently diverse community of experts so that the range of views is um, being is being considered is, is, is proper. If you have a trustworthy consensus of this kind, your value should already be held by at least one member of that expert community that has debated the issue, which means um, their concerns, if they agree with the consensus, which they should if there's a consensus, um, has already been met. And so there is an expert in there who share your, shares your values and also takes off the other two concerns of functioning expertise and being part of a critical and diverse community. So it's actually consensus captures the concern about values if you have a sufficient diversity of experts. But I actually think it's a mistake to put too much weight on consensus as a necessary condition for public trust, because that incentivizes um, uh, creating dissensus. So in cases of ongoing disagreement, which I think is normal in science, and we don't want to actually incentivize the more of it than we actually have, so we shouldn't force the consensus, the public should find experts properly participating in the debate that should already share their values. Right, so that's really important. Um, okay, and this gets to, I think, uh, I'm getting very close to the end here. So what does this mean um, for our general political sphere? There's been a lot of talk about concerns about weaponizing science. Um, and I think actually presenting science as value free and presenting trust as something that shouldn't be based on values actually increases the probability of weaponization. And that's because presenting science as value free makes it seem perfect and impervious. We want it this like perfect knowledge formation, like Captain American Shield, utterly impervious. But as we've known from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, perfect shields make great weapons. Um, and so everyone wants science on their side precisely because it seems like the imperfect and impervious shield to bash aside your opponents. So I think presenting science as value free and as impervious in this way to sort of gen general criticism and concern helps to weaponize science. If we acknowledge that science is not a perfect impervious shield, it decreases the weaponiz weaponization ability of the science. All right, so in conclusion, I think the public can and should have reasons to trust science, even particular scientists. And I think these are um, as moments of assessment that the public can actually manage. They can look for experts who demonstrate expertise, not necessarily in success, but at least in explanations of their views. They need to look for um, markers that the expert is participating in a well-functioning critical community by checking to see whether or not they're participating, for example, in scientific conferences and in um, uh, debate and practices, critical practices of the community. And then they also need to see that they're having the appropriate values, including value and inquiry, um, but social and eth ethical values in particular. Now, right now, if the value for ideal is still ascendant, the public can actually have problems with assessing all three of these bases. Um, and so I think scientists should generally explain or partially, at least partially, their expert judgments, discuss aspects of ongoing debate to demonstrate the presence of debate um, when it's happening so that the public can see that the scientists are doing their jobs properly, i.e. debating the issues properly and being open about key value judgments. I actually think this should reduce the weaponization of science, oddly enough. I know that's a counterintuitive conclusion, and I hope we can discuss it in Q&A more. So thanks.